then um, we'll not interrupt the presentation unless it's a, a vital matter of clarification or something. But we'll hold up our main questions, substantive questions for the for the end of the talk. Okay, so this is the last colloquium of the uh, truncated semester, and uh, we're no pun intended, ending with a bang uh, <laughs> on the on a, what's unfortunately a rather timely topic, uh, reducing the risk of of nuclear war, and we're very fortunate to have. Dr. Steve Fetter with us. Uh, Steve started his career with an undergraduate physics degree from MIT and then a PhD in energy and resources from Berkeley. He then moved into policy studies and is now in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. In between getting his PhD and now, he's made a huge impact in an extraordinarily wide range of advisory and administrative posts. For example, he had two spells in the White House as assistant director in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and before that worked in the Department of Defense and in the State Department. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the APS. He received the APS Burton Forum Award, and most recently, the APS 2021 Leo Szilard Prize. He's been a member of the Intelligence Science Board and DOE's Nuclear Energy Advisory Committee. He was vice chairman of the Federation of American Scientists and received its Hans Bethe Science in the Public Service Award. So we're very fortunate to have him speak to us as, as part of a program organized by the Physicists Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction with support from the APS. Steve. Thank you, Philip. And I'm, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. I would very much like to visit uh, the campus in Cleveland. I, I haven't had the pleasure, but uh, one of my uh, closest uh, colleagues and collaborators in, in this area is uh, Richard Darwin, who uh, you may know is a graduate of your physics program quite some time ago, but more recently, I understand, received a, an honorary uh, a doctorate, which uh, I, I think is uh, well-reserved. So let me uh, just be sure to note at the beginning that uh, although this, I am a member of this Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction that is funded by the APS, that the views uh, that I'll express are, are my own. And, so just a quick outline, I'll give a brief primer on nuclear weapons, uh, how they basically work and what materials they use, a high level overview of global nuclear arsenals today and uh, more detail on the US nuclear arsenal and the plans and the programs that are underway to modernize it. Uh, some of the risks that nuclear weapons pose to us and other countries the policies that the Obama and Trump administrations have pursued to try to reduce those risks, and then some proposals for the next administration. And I confess that these are the same slides I used just before the election, so I don't have anything in here that specifically refers to the next administration. I have to update that. So uh, all nuclear explosions begin with a fast fission chain reaction. Uh, in a material that can sustain such a reaction. And the two most common materials are high enriched uranium or HEU and plutonium. So all nuclear weapons contain one or both of those materials. Uh, in uranium, natural uranium is only 0.7% uh, uranium-235, the isotope that can sustain a fast fission chain reaction. So to uh, build a weapon, you need material that is on the order of 90% U-235. And so, uh, there, yeah, as you know, there's no chemical difference between two isotopes or a very, very tiny chemical difference. And so you have to separate the isotopes based only on their mass. And that was originally done in the Manhattan Project using electromagnetic separation. You know, ionize a, a, an atom and pass it through a magnetic uh, field and the 
uh, light uh, isotope will bend more than the heaviest isotope. Later in the United States, we use gaseous diffusion. Right at a given temperature, the U-235 will be moving faster than the U-238 uh, molecules. Uh, but in most of the world right now, it's done with gas centrifuges. And that may sound familiar because a lot of the controversy with Iran has been over their development of gas centrifuges and their, the use of gas centrifuges to produce enriched uranium. Uranium that's enriched to say 4% or 5%, you know, they had enriched up to 20%, but once you can enrich up to those levels, you can easily go up to 90%. And just recently, laser enrichment has um, become a commercial process using the very small differences in the electron, electronic structure of U-235 and U-238 to selectively uh, excite one of the isotopes. The other uh, main uh, material is plutonium. All isotopes of plutonium, pretty much, can be used in a nuclear explosive. In a nuclear explosive, they can all sustain a chain reaction. Plutonium doesn't exist in nature, but you can produce it from uranium in a nuclear reactor because U-238 will absorb a neutron and decay to plutonium, 239, following that reaction. In fact, you can produce about one gram of plutonium for every megawatt day of reactor operation. So a small reactor, like the 25 megawatt reactor that Israel first built, that um, France and the UK first built, that, uh, that North Korea uh, had built, that Iran had plans to build, a 25 megawatt reactor will produce about eight kilograms of plutonium a year, and that's enough for one or two bombs. And the advantage of plutonium, as you'll see, is that its critical mass is much smaller than uranium-235, and it can be chemically separated. But because, of course, this is, is happening in highly radioactive nuclear fuel, the plutonium has to be separated from the highly radioactive fission products. And so both of those processes are difficult, enrichment and reprocessing. And the key to limiting the spread of nuclear weapons is limiting the spread of those technologies. So I had to put a little bit of physics in this since this is a physics colloquium. Um, the cross section for fast fission for uranium-235 is about one barn. And so you just, I think you can see my pointer, correct? By cursor, yeah. So it's a straightforward calculation that the mean free path at um, the regular density of uranium, about 19 grams per cubic centimeter, is 20 centimeters. And so it won't surprise you that the critical mass, in other words, the mass of U-235, that would just sustain a fast fission chain reaction, is about 20 centimeters. It's actually 17 centimeter diameter sphere or about 50 kilograms of uranium-235. If you have more than that, you will have an exponentially growing chain reaction. Okay. For plutonium though, the cross section is two barns. And so the critical mass is quite a bit smaller. You also get more neutrons per fission with plutonium. You, there are about um, two or three neutrons produced in every fission, and that is the basis for an exponentially growing chain reaction. Now, these critical masses can be increased in two ways. They can be increased by surrounding the fissile material with a reflector, like beryllium, or by increasing the density, right, by bringing all of the nuclei closer together, and both techniques are used. Now, just to, to show why um, nuclear weapons are so extremely uh, destructive. Uh, about 200 MeV is released per fission, and most of that comes in the kinetic energy of the fission fragments, a little bit of neutrons and gamma rays. That produces prompt radiation. The decay of the fission products also uh, uh, releases energy, about 13 MeV per fission. But that takes place over seconds and minutes and days and years. And then, of course, the neutrinos just go off into space or through the Earth. And these neutrons are moving quite fast, uh, 6 or 7% of the speed of light. And so you can calculate how long it takes for each of these generations to happen. Because 
the mean free path is 20 centimeters. The neutrons are moving two times 10 to the ninth centimeters per second. And so it's about 10 nanoseconds per generation, per fission generation. And that unit of time uh, is called a shake by people in the weapons business, as in shake of a lamb's tail. And so you can you know, calculate how many, if you wanted to fission an entire kilogram of uranium-238, you would fission that many nuclei, and that would be 81 generations. So 81 of these would result in the fission of one kilogram of U-235, and that fission would release, I thought I had it somewhere on here, 17 and a half, oh yes, there it is, 17 and a half, an energy equivalent to 17 and a half thousand tons of TNT. Or speaking sort of World War II terms, uh, when the biggest bombs were less than a ton, you know, 20,000 bombs worth of um, explosive power. And of course, because this is exponential, 99.9% .9 of that is released in the last 10 generations or in about a tenth of a microsecond. In fact, in the first two nuclear weapons that were used, did, did fission about one kilogram of material. The Hiroshima bomb detonated with the yield of 15 kilotons and Nagasaki with 20 kilotons. And these are schematic or cartoon diagrams of what the Hiroshima bomb looked like and the Nagasaki bomb. The Hiroshima bomb was a gun-type device. It just bought, brought one uh, critic, subcritical mass, a sort of a, a hollow bullet, together with a target that was also subcritical. All of this was surrounded by a reflector at the bottom, creating a supercritical mass into which a neutron, neutrons were injected, resulting in an explosion. But you will see this was not a very efficient device. It used 50 kilograms of uranium-235, but less than 2% of that was fission. Much more efficient, so by the way, this is a very, very simple device. If you give anyone 50 kilograms of uranium-235, they can make this work without very much uh, technical uh, design, you know, sophistication. In fact, it's almost as easy as dropping one piece onto another. But that won't work for plutonium because plutonium has a high rate of spontaneous fission. It's always emitting neutrons at a high rate. And so if you did this with plutonium, it would start to go critical as soon as it reached a critical mass. You could never really get a supercritical mass. And the efficiency of an explosion is highly sensitive to the supercritical, supercriticality that you start out with. And so for plutonium, the technique is to increase its density by surrounding it with conventional high explosives and detonating them so they result in a symmetrical implosion of the plutonium. And in that way, you can double or triple the density of the plutonium. And you can see in the Fat Man device, only six kilograms of plutonium were included, but that resulted in a yield of 20 kilotons more than the Fat Man bomb, an efficiency of 18%. Now this is, I, I am, Sorry to say what a city looks like after an explosion of 15 kilotons, 15,000 tons of TNT. This is what Hiroshima looked like at, uh, immediately after the bombing, and 125,000 people died. Uh, most of those were from the immediate effects of the bomb, the air blast, the um, burns and firestorm, the flying debris from the air, air blast. Uh, there were smaller, smaller proportion of deaths from radiation and radiation-induced cancer. And that is, by today's standards, a small nuclear weapon. So that was 1945. Since the 1970s, uh, all of the weapons that are deployed by the United States and Russia and China and France and the UK look like this. And they utilize fission reactions, a fission device. That's here's the, oops, sorry, here's the fission device. 
a, a fission device that's a primary, an implosion device, that has a yield of a few kilotons. They use the radiation from that, trapped in this radiation case, to implode a secondary that has a fusion fuel. So the X-rays from the fission device uh, uh, heat and vaporize the, the layer on the, on the secondary, causing the secondary to implode to such a density that fusion reactions occur. And the fusion fuel is usually the solid fusion fuel lithium deuteride. So lithium-6 and the lithium is enriched in lithium-6 that absorbs a neutron that uh, releases energy and produces tritium. And the tritium fuses with deuterium uh, to release a lot of energy in the neutron. And as you can see, the neutron just can then be used uh, for more fusion or for fission. And using these design principles, this is the bomb that Teller and Ulam invented, but it was actually Richard Darwin who designed the first fusion weapon. The, I think it was the, um, uh, I forget now the code name of the test, but it, I, the, the yield was uh, 15 megatons, 15 million tons of TNT. So a thousand times more powerful than the first nuclear weapons. Uh, we deployed weapons with yields of 25,000 kilotons, 25 megatons. The Soviet Union produced a design of 100 megatons. Today, the average yield of a, of a deployed weapon is about 350 kilotons, three or about 20 times the yield of the Hiroshima bomb. And uh, this is what the radius of destruction would be if such a weapon were detonated above the White House. Uh, I live right there in College Park, but uh, I would not be safe. Um, so everything within this radius would be destroyed by blast. Everything within about that 12 mile diameter would be destroyed by fire. Uh, heat and fire, and uh, roughly a million deaths would result from such a thing. So how many of those weapons exist in the world, given how destructive they are? So a single weapon, a single deployed weapon, can destroy a city, and you might find it absolutely shocking uh, and maybe appalling that at one point we deployed 30,000 such weapons. And the Soviet Union, deployed 40,000. Uh, and the, at one point, there were a total of over 70,000 of these weapons in the world, each one of which could destroy a city. Well, fortunately, the Cold War ended. And as a result of that, whoops, I'm sorry, we were able to reduce our arsenals quite substantially by about 90%. But still, today, the US and um, Russia each deploy about 4,000 weapons. And in the meantime, other countries have developed and deployed nuclear weapons. So here are global arsenals today. The United States uh, and Russia, about 4,000. This is a pretty exact number. That's uh, an estimate. Together, the US and Russia account for 90% of the world's arsenals. The other members of the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council, uh, have about two or three hundred, France, China, and the United Kingdom. Pakistan and India also have substantial numbers of nuclear weapons, about 150 each. Israel has never acknowledged that it has nuclear weapons, but is universally regarded to have them, to have about 80. And North Korea probably has a couple dozen. So in all, nearly 10,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Looking a little closer at the US uh, nuclear stockpile. So you remember I said we have 3,800. Well, a breakdown of that is we have about 1,600 deployed strategic nuclear weapons. So strategic means they're on long range delivery vehicles, including ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. There are 400 Minuteman missiles in silos, each armed with one warhead. There are 12 Trident ballistic missile submarines at any one time, um, 
seven or eight of them are on patrol at sea uh, where they are undetectable. Each of those submarines has 20 uh, D5 missiles and each of the missiles has four to five warheads. So about 900 war warheads on missiles. And then we have bombers. We still have B-52 bombers armed with air launch cruise missiles and we have 20 B-2 bombers. So all about 1,600 of which 900 are on alert right now and could be launched within a few minutes. There also are about 150 non-strategic warheads, short head, uh, bombs on short range uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, those are in, deployed in Europe and we have 2,000 warheads in reserve. We also have 2,000 warheads that are retired and are awaiting dismantling. So that's the U.S. stockpile. And this is what the delivery vehicles look like. This is the Minuteman missile, a Trident submarine, a B-2 bomber, and a B-52 bomber. And all of this is to be replaced starting in about 2030, uh, a new ICBM, a new submarine, and a new bomber at a cost of about $1.2 trillion, which as they say, even for the Pentagon is real money. And that is the breakdown the 1.2 trillion number is a little unfair because actually most of that is for the operation and sustainment of the force. So you'd have those expenditures even if you didn't modernize. So this is just the cost of the new delivery vehicles. And as you can see, this will take us out to the end of the century with a fairly large deployed force. And here you can see this budget profile. Um, a few years ago, well, uh, the, the amount that we normally spend for the operation of the nuclear force is a, about $25 uh, billion dollars a year. Uh, that will about double with modernization included to a total of about $50 billion a year. And to put that in perspective, $50 billion is about what the United States spends on all research. Um, Per year, what the federal government spends, not sorry, not the United States, what the federal government spends on research. Okay, now nuclear weapons are, why do we have them? Well, we have them to deter a nuclear attack. And that's why Russia has them and China and so on. We say we don't intend to use them, we just have them so that no one will attack us with nuclear weapons. But mistakes are possible. There is the danger of a conflict that could escalate to the use of nuclear weapons, and that could involve Russian aggression against a NATO country because we're pledged to come to the defense of NATO countries as if it were an attack on us. And we, we have pledged to use nuclear weapons in response to an attack, a nuclear attack on um, an ally, a NATO ally. Nuclear weapons might be used as a result of an attack by China. Uh, for example, against Taiwan. Taiwan might move toward independence. There might be a territorial dispute between Japan uh, and China that escalates. Or North Korea might attack South Korea or Japan. Or there might be a war between India and China that escalates to the use of nuclear weapons. And of course, Israel has been involved in wars over its history. So that's one danger, the danger of, an, of the escalation of a conventional conflict. And whoever is on the losing side doesn't want to give up. And so in desperation, they resort to the use of nuclear weapons, or they worry that there might be a preemptive attack against their nuclear forces, and they choose to use it before they lose it. Accidental, inadvertent, or unauthorized use is also a danger. Um, in the early days of our nuclear arsenal, our nuclear weapons were vulnerable to an accidental nuclear detonation. There was the possibility that if the high explosives detonated accidentally as the result of a fire or dropping of a weapon or a conventional round, that a nuclear explosion would result. Now, our weapons are now designed to be safe against that. But we don't know if other countries' weapons are safe against that. 
There also have been false warnings of attack, both here in the United States, there have been several that have been publicly documented, but also in Russia. In fact, there was a film released a few uh, months ago called The Man Who Saved the World, which was the story of a, an error in a new Russian uh, Soviet uh, early warning system that indicated a US attack against the Soviet Union. And the commanding officer in that case decided to ignore the warning, not to transmit the warning along because he thought it was probably a false warning because if the US were going to attack, it would not attack with just a few weapons. And fortunately he was right, it was a mistake. And there also is the possibility in some countries that, uh, the, that nuclear weapons may be able to be launched or used without the uh, approval of the highest political authorities. And uh, aside from countries, there is, the, there is the concern about nuclear terrorism. After the end of the Cold War, the security of nuclear materials decreased dramatically in Russia, but also in former states of the former Soviet Union. And there were there are, there are 21 known intercepts of stolen high enriched uranium and plutonium. Not enough to build a weapon in any of those cases, but when you start finding stolen materials, that indicates that there's material you haven't found, right? Just like drug interdiction never finds all the drugs, probably the interdiction of nuclear materials has not found all of the stolen material. And then finally, even if none of this ever occurs, even if there's never a nuclear explosion, there can be nuclear arms races that erode stability and result in unnecessary expenditures. And that's something that happened during the Cold War and something that I'm worried could happen again. And President Obama was very concerned about these um, threats, nuclear threats, when he was a senator. And when he um, became president, one of his earliest speeches was about reducing nuclear threats. And he gave a uh, landmark speech in Prague uh, just a few months after becoming president. And uh, uh, we often referred to these four pillars of the Prague agenda. The first was to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in US national security strategy and to urge others to do the same, to negotiate a new START treaty, which happened, um, and to seek further cuts and to include all nuclear weapons in all nuclear states, and that didn't happen, um, to uh, uh, maintain a secure, a safe, secure nuclear arsenal to deter any adversary, to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty, uh, and to bring North Korea and Iran back into compliance, uh, and to ensure that terrorists never acquire a nuclear weapon. And a centerpiece of that was an effort to secure vulnerable nuclear materials. So how did we do? And I say we because well, I was I was there for five years, and <laughs> so I felt like. Uh, a, a, an active participant. And yes, we did get the New START Treaty and that reduced deployed strategic weapons by one third. For nuclear policy, for the first time, the US promised not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against any non-nuclear state that was in, com in compliance with its nuclear weapon obligation. And also promised not to develop any new nuclear warheads and a review of nuclear policy determined that we could see a one-third reduction, a further one-third reduction in deployed strategic weapons. So from 1,500 about to 1,000. And he called on Russia, he called on President Putin to negotiate such a treaty. Unfortunately, President Putin decided to invade Ukraine shortly after that. And so uh, cooperation between the US and Russia and arms control talks pretty much ended around that time. For in the nuclear terrorism, counterterrorism agenda, there was substantial progress. Four nuclear security summits were held. And as a result of the promises made in those summits, 4,000 kilograms of high enriched uranium were removed. And that's enough for hundreds of nuclear weapons. And all of the high enriched uranium was removed from 33 countries. And it's particularly important to remove the HEU because remember from that, those first slides, it's very easy to make a bomb 
with HEU. You don't need technical sophistication. It's really just a matter of bringing two pieces of high enriched uranium together quickly. And in nonproliferation, the um, crowning achievement was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, which um, reduced Iran's capacity to enrich uranium and its stockpiles of enriched uranium by 95% and imposed a, a rigorous inspection regime on Iran. Uh, but then uh, we, we moved to a different vision in the Trump administration. And the Trump administration held a nuclear posture review that concluded that the United States needed new low yield weapons to expand the range of credible options and in fact explicitly um, uh, expanded the uh, uses of nuclear weapons beyond uh, the deterrence of nuclear attack on the United States and our allies. And of course, President Trump, in many statements, eroded security guarantees to allies in Europe as well as Japan, suggesting at one point that South Korea and Japan might develop their own nuclear weapons so they wouldn't have to rely on the United States. The Trump administration expanded ballistic missile defense programs in ways that prompted both Russia and China to increase and modernize their offensive forces. Um, the Trump administration opened negotiations with North Korea, which is very positive. And I don't, I, I think his meeting with Kim Jong-un was a fine thing to do. Unfortunately, it did not result in any agreement. The Trump administration withdrew from the Intermediate Range uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty and the Iran Agreement uh, toward in the last six months or so, there were proposals to resume nuclear testing to gain leverage in negotiations with Russia and China. And uh, I should have updated my slide, but <laughs> so in principle, the Trump administration said it'd be willing to extend New START for a year, but only under certain conditions where Russia was asking for the extension of the treaty with no conditions. So that is where we stand today. And so, you know, very quickly, I'd just like to talk about some options for how the next administration could reduce nuclear risks. And the first is to extend the New START Treaty. So this is the only remaining treaty between the United States and Russia, which is really quite remarkable in itself. That treaty can be extended for five years with a simple change of diplomatic notes. But if this treaty expires, and it's due to expire on February 5th, the US and Russia would be without agreed limits for the first time in 50 years. But the Biden, but uh, President-elect Biden has indicated that this will be one of his first acts to extend the New START Treaty. So here you can see um, the history of US, Russian, US, Soviet arms control. Um, you know, the things to note here is that there's lots of overlap between these that before one treaty ends, the negotiation of the next treaty begins, and that there's always been a treaty in force or under negotiation. This is really the first time in 50 years that um, there's just the one treaty and there's nothing else under negotiation. And uh, so <laughs> fortunately, uh, a New START, um, President Lick Biden will extend New START. So I don't really have to go on more about this, I think. Uh, oh, I should note that the treaty, what the Trump administration was holding out for was a treaty that included China, but there was nothing, no time for that. But what's not often realized is that these treaties contain verification and confidence building measures that allow us to know how many weapons the other side has. And without those data exchanges and notification, and on-site inspections, we'd have to increase our intelligence collection just to know what the Russians were doing, how many forces they had. And that could cost billions of dollars of increased intelligence expenditure, but it could also lead to an arms race because the CIA is never going to know um, about Russian forces as well as it knows 
based on the on-site inspections and transparency measures, sort of the voluntary measures. The CIA will never, you know, it, if you're invited to visit a deployment site, you can learn things that you could never learn through spy satellites and spies with a much higher level of confidence. Okay, I will just go over that. But this was an APS uh, American Physical Society board statement supporting the extension of the New York of the New START Treaty that was adopted. I think we need to start exploring alternatives to treaties. We still need restraint. I mean, even if New START is renewed, it will only be in effect for five years. And treaties are getting more and more difficult. And in fact, I think now almost impossible. New START received only 71 votes, and that's when the Democrats had 58 senators. So I, I should remind everyone that treaties to be ratified need two thirds vote of the Senate, so 67 senators. Um, so even New START had only 13 Republicans supporting it. And the administration paid a high price for ratification, and that's what I'll talk about in a minute, is the modernization of those nuclear forces. That was the price that those 13 Republicans demanded for their votes. Also, Russia is uninterested in reductions without some limits on US missile defenses, but the Republicans in the Senate have made it clear that they support no limits on US missile defenses. And in fact, would never ratify a treaty, would never vote to ratify a treaty that contained any limits. And so I, need, I think we need to think about other ways, executive agreements, um, political commitments, reciprocal unilateral measures where we reduce forces and invite uh, the Russians to do the same and say we will reverse our reductions if they don't. I do think though that we could simply reduce the size of our forces without any reduction in the size of the Russian force. In fact, that um, the uh, re-examination of nuclear policy in the Obama administration, the Pentagon determined that a thousand deployed weapons were enough for deterrence, regardless of whether the Russians reduced theirs. A second measure would be to eliminate the launch on warning option. And if that were done, it would make sense to eliminate silo-based ICBMs entirely. So st stability, stable deterrence depends on both sides having forces that can survive any attack and deliver devastating retaliation, right? That is the heart of deterrence. The Russians would never attack us because we would always have surviving forces that could completely destroy Russia. The problem is that they have missiles that can destroy our missiles, and we have missiles that can destroy their missiles. And so we keep those missiles, we keep those ICBMs on constant alert, ready to be launched in a few minutes on warning of an attack. We have satellites that are looking for their missile launches. They have satellites that are looking for our missile launches. We have radars that can detect the incoming uh, warheads. Um, we keep these forces ready to be launched so that we have the option of launching our missiles before they can be destroyed by Russian missiles. And the Russians are doing the same thing, which is kind of crazy because it forces the uh, president on either side to make decisions within five minutes, basically, of whether to launch their missiles under attack. And the real irony of all of this, it, and so that does, of course, lead to the possibility of launching on a false warning. As I mentioned, both the US and Russia have had false warnings. We just realized they were false warnings before a decision had to be made. Um, but the really frustrating thing or ironic thing is that launch on warning is pointless because our missiles are pointed at their missiles. If their missiles had already been launched, and we launched ours under attack, they would only hit empty silos on the other side. So I believe stability would be improved and 
tens of billions, maybe about $100 billion would be saved simply by phasing out silo-based ICBMs, in our case, the Minuteman missile, and not, not replacing. Another uh, suggestion would be to adopt a policy of sole purpose or no first use, which are closely aligned. This was considered during the Obama administration, both possibilities. Sole purpose means you would state the sole purpose of US nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack against the United States and its allies, or if deterrence fails to retaliate. And no first use means that it, the US wouldn't use nuclear weapons unless the US or its allies had been attacked with nuclear weapons. And uh, I am I'm pleased to say that, that the Biden campaign did state that it supported uh, sole purpose. And so I think we could expect that a Biden administration would adopt this policy. I did uh, want to note though that, and there will be opposition to sole purpose or no first use. And I did want to note how this undermines nonproliferation because Imagine what it means for the United States to say that it needs nuclear weapons for some purpose other than deterrence, for some purpose other than to respond to a nuclear attack. The US spends four times more in defense than China, 10 times more than Russia, 80 times more than North Korea. The US, when you put us together with our allies, we account for over 70% of world military spending four times more than all potential adversaries combined. So if we say we need nuclear weapons to respond to non-nuclear attacks, wouldn't other countries have even more need of nuclear weapons? And I think this is my final suggestion is to limit ballistic missile defense. So ballistic missile defense was originally conceived in the early, late 1950s and early 1960s. Shortly after the Soviet Union developed ICBMs, it was intended to defeat those Soviet ICBMs, to protect the United States against ICBMs. But what we discovered was that the Soviet Union could defeat the system, could defeat the system in various ways and always could, either by building more missiles or by deploying countermeasures that would defeat the defense. And that realization led to the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1970. Um, it, I should back up and say, we also realized that there could be no limits on offense without a limit on defense. Because the countermeasure to, to defense was to simply build up the offense. So if you wanted to limit the arms race, you had to limit defenses. And the Russians or the Soviets really resisted this at first. They said, well, defense is good, right? Protecting yourself is always a good thing. But it's not a good thing if the other side simply responds by overwhelming your defense by building a, a new offense. So that was the debate during the 1960s. And then things went quiet until um, you know, the 1980s and Star Wars, but then that also. Uh, that never led to any deployments. But when other countries, and in particular Iran and North Korea, began to develop ballistic missiles, the focus became on regional defenses. Uh, and we have deployed two systems, a ground-based missile defense in Alaska to protect us against North Korean missiles, and regional missile defenses in Europe and Asia to protect our allies against North Korean or Iranian missiles. And uh, I, I guess I've already described how ballistic missile defense can, can be both ineffective and counterproductive. It can be ineffective because, they're, um, because defenses are vulnerable to countermeasures. And here are just a few of them. Chaff to confuse radars. As all physicists know, in the vacuum of space, everything follows the same trajectory regardless of mass. And so you can have thousands of lightweight balloons that are accompanying the um, warhead. And you can put the warhead inside of a balloon. I think this idea, anti-simulation, was another thing that Dick Darwin invented. You know, instead of uh, dressing up a uh, hundred people to look like the king, make the king look like a beggar. 
and uh, <laughs> to defeat assassination attempts. Or uh, very effective countermeasures are precursor or uh, precursor nuclear bursts or equipping a nuclear warhead so that if it is attacked by a defensive interceptor, it will detonate before it can be destroyed. Uh, and that the nuclear burst itself generates radar and infrared effects that defeat the defense. And ballistic missile defense can be counterproductive because it prompts Russia and China to increase their offensive forces and their reliance on launch under attack, launch on warning to ensure penetration of the defense. And if you want a good example of this, uh, please look up uh, Putin's March 2018 speech. I won't read all of this, but he laid out a program of Russian modernization, including a new ICBM, a huge ICBM, that so large it could attack the US from the south. Why from the south over Antarctica? Because our radars are pointed north toward Russia. Hypersonic glide vehicles to evade missile defenses. Intercontinental nuclear powered high speed torpedoes and sort of most crazy of all, an intercontinental nuclear powered hypersonic cruise missile. That's a air breathing cruise missile powered by a nuclear reactor. So I think the trick is to find ways to deal with the Iranian and North Korea missile threats in ways that don't trigger these reactions by Russia and China. In the Iranian case, I think Iran has shown that it's open to an agreement limiting its nuclear potential. It also has said it has no interest in long range missiles. So we could have an agreement that would try to enforce that. And in North Korea, North Korea is a very small peninsula. And North Korea, you might have a boost phase defense by drones operating outside of North Korea's airspace. And that would pose no threat to Russia and China. So those are my uh, proposals. Uh, what can physicists do and physics students do? Well, uh, you can educate yourself about these issues and then lobby your, your representatives. And then in the area of shame promotion, you can read everything I've written and other people have written on this. So there's an article with Dick Darwin, who I mentioned earlier in Physics Today a couple of years ago. That's what launched this project to try to raise awareness of these issues uh, among the physics community. And uh, here are some other articles all available at my website. And then finally, you can join the coalition to uh, reduce nuclear threats, the coalition that's funded by the APS. Here is the, uh, the URL and you can go there and learn more. You can uh, watch a, a video of a, a session we did on nuclear testing. I hope there will be uh, more sessions later that, um, that you can watch. And I think right after this, uh, right after this colloquium, we'll have a little bit more about the coalition. So with that, let me stop and invite questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steve. That was very, very informative. And uh, so if anyone does have a question, um, they can use the chat box or raise a hand, which I probably won't see because we have twice as we have 57 people and more than will fit on a screen here. Um, I'll start by asking a, a question about whether I understand no, none of the ballistic missiles can be recalled after they've been launched. And uh, there are good arguments for why they should not be able to be recalled. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so unlike bombers, which have a pilot, and you could always be in communication with a pilot right up until the final moment that a weapon is used, the missiles are launched, and after they're launched, there's no ability to recall or destroy them. And the reason is that there is a concern that if you had a device, that would a command destruct device. And by the way, all space launches have such a device. All test launches do, because if an errant missile, you know, if you launch a missile from Kennedy Space Center and it looks like it's going over inhabited territory, you, you would want to destroy that, right, before it um, 
could land in a populated area. But the worry is that your adversary could learn that this this exists and could and could hack it and could command your missiles to to destroy themselves after they're after they've been launched. It's for the same reason that nuclear missiles do not rely on GPS because there's they only have inertial guidance because there's a concern that an adversary could interfere with GPS or spoof GPS and and lead missiles off course. So after uh, a president issues an order to use nuclear weapons, that order would be transmitted to forces in the field in a matter of just a couple of minutes. And once the crews have turned the keys, turned the launch keys, there would be no possibility of recalling uh, or um, countermanding that launch order. Thank you. Let's see, uh, going in order, I see Harsh has a question. Um, yeah, I was just curious about the, about the yields of modern nuclear weapons, which seem to be lower than the peak that they had reached in the early, early days. And um, I was wondering what the reason for that is. I mean, obviously it seems a little destabilizing because the lower the yield is, the more the, you know, risk is that it might seem okay to use. But I was wondering what the thinking behind that is. Well, two things. One is, as you saw, a 300 kiloton weapon destroys an entire large city like Washington, D.C. And so you don't really need more. When we had, we had 20 megaton weapons at one time to compensate for the inaccuracy of delivery. You didn't know, you, you couldn't deliver it exactly on the target. And so the yield compensated for that. But today the delivery is very precise, you know, within tens of meters of a target. And for military targets, in fact, you don't need 300 kilotons, you know, tens of kilotons would be enough. And, uh, you know, for even the largest cities you, or industrial targets, energy targets, you don't need a larger weapon. Now, about smaller weapons maybe being dangerous because they're more usable, because they're smaller, that, that is, there are many people who maintain that. And in fact, that some of the objections to the Navy deploying a lower yield submarine launch missile were based on that, that it lowered the nuclear threshold. Personally, I believe any nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon. And even when people say small nuclear weapon, Today, they mean something like 10 kilotons. That's the yield of the new Navy weapon. Well, you saw what a 15 kiloton weapon did to Hiroshima. So <laughs> you know, 10,000 tons of TNT is not a small explosion. And I hope and I believe that any US president would consider any use of the nuclear weapon, no matter how small, to be such a momentous act that there really wouldn't be a difference. The president wouldn't say, well, that's only a 10 kiloton weapon. So somehow, you know, that's easier for me to order the use. It would, it would still be a nuclear attack and it would bring with it the escalation of these much higher yield weapons. Very good. Uh, Emily had a question. Let's see. People are able to unmute themselves, are they? Yes, they should be able to. Very good. Em, you'd like to ask your question? I guess not. Okay, we'll go to uh, Peter Thomas then. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the important talks. Could you comment on the vulnerability of current resources to cyber attack or cyber you know, activation by a third party? So as you can imagine, the details about nuclear command and control are extremely sensitive, partly because people worry about things like this. Um, say is that strategic command worries a lot about this and has done an assessment that they believe is thorough. I participated in a much earlier assessment of these risks. It was in the early 1990s. Um, and they believe that no third, that there is no plausible uh, route for a third party that to, to hack our system. 
and to launch a nuclear attack. Now, if they were aware of anything, they would fix it, right? If they were aware of a problem, what people worry about is that there may be a, an unidentified um, uh, problem. So I'm, you know, the Iranians felt pretty sure that their centrifuge facility was immune from cyber attack because it was air gapped. You know, there was no connection between that facility and the outside world. But as the cyber attacks on Iran showed, insiders can get in to an air gap system. And so I think in, that ca in this case, for your question, the concern is more about an insider threat than it is about um, someone totally outside of the system. Glenn, you have a question. Thanks. So we tend to take an American perspective on, on, this, on these issues. And I'm wondering how, if there are, uh, if some of our attempts to, uh, to address these issues put pro-proliferation pressures on other countries. So for example, you mentioned, you know, um, a ban, an Iranian agreement, uh, willingness to ban long, you know, to, to give up long range missiles. But of course, there's lots of countries who feel antagonized by Iran that are in, within less than 2000 miles. Or we might look in Europe where if, if we have a, you know, a sole purpose a commitment that then we, we, we might imagine Germany all of a sudden getting, getting more nervous or Poland uh, and, and that, there, that these create proliferation pr uh, um, pressures. So how does one balance those, those competing evils or goods? Or yeah, this, this gets to something called extended deterrence, which uh, is the idea that the U.S. can extend security guarantees to allies by saying, not only are our nuclear weapons to deter nuclear attack against us, but if there's a nuclear attack against our allies, we will respond with nuclear weapons. And in fact, we've made that uh, promise in one form or another to our NATO allies and to Japan and to South Korea. And the reason we do that is to persuade them that they don't need their own nuclear forces. So this was really key to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to the signature of the Non-Proliferation Treaty by Germany, by Japan, by South Korea, convincing them that they didn't need their own nuclear forces. And if we adopted a sole purpose or no first use policy, we'd have to make it clear that that doesn't make them vulnerable, that what we're saying is we would use nuclear weapons only in response to an attack on us or our allies. So, you know, they would not have any incentive to develop their own nuclear forces. But wouldn't their incentive be to respond to non-nuclear attacks? I mean, because they are, they are much closer than we are. We, we are not terribly as anywhere near as vulnerable to non-nuclear attacks. That's but a good they point. Are. And that's why it's extremely important that we and our allies are able to respond to all non-nuclear attacks without using nuclear weapons. And that's right. partly why I showed all those statistics about defense spending. Now, the fact is that the United States and its allies are, have conventional superiority in almost all scenarios. There are just a few, like China and Taiwan, where it's really not clear that we could prevail. But in almost every, uh, no, in every other scenario that I'm aware of, and of course the Pentagon plans for lots of scenarios, that involve our allies too, right. say North and South Korea, an invasion of South Korea by North Korea. And in all of those scenarios, we believe, I believe that we can, and, I, and our allies should believe that they and we can defend themselves without resort to nuclear weapons. And I also encourage them to think about what it would mean for the United States to start a nuclear war. So when any Japanese policy analyst suggests that that they might have to that there might be that we might have to respond to nuclear weapons we might have to respond with nuclear weapons to a non-nuclear attack i challenge them to say the circumstances where they want us to start a nuclear war on their behalf 
because they would be the first targets of retaliation. <laughs> if they're in a if they're in a uh, war with North Korea, with China, uh, with Russia, and nuclear weapons are used first in that conflict, then our ally can expect to be the target of retaliation. And I've never really gotten a persuasive response to that. <laughs> but and this is completely different during the Cold War, right? In the Cold War, we believed the Soviet Union was superior in conventional military strength to the NATO alliance. We believed we had to threaten the use of nuclear weapons in response to a conventional attack. But now I really don't know anyone who believes that that, that is necessary or desirable. Thanks. Okay, I see that uh, M. Dragowski is having some problems, but I can read her question. Uh, does federal law prohibit states from enacting laws against nuclear materials generation and processing? I don't know, but I, I bet that all of that is under federal jurisdiction. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure it is. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert in that area. But I, I would think that to uh, have, to produce, to enrich uranium, to operate any nuclear facility, you'd have to have a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so it would be under federal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Also, any, uh, I think any possession of nuclear material, uh, of, spe of special nuclear materials, would have to be licensed. Cleveland Heights is a non-nuclear zone, but I don't think that has a great deal of legal impact. <laughs> yes, well, I've lived in a couple of nuclear-free zones, and I remember at the time federal officials saying it had, would have no effect. In <laughs> Right. So uh, Scott Woods is next. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Steve. It's always uh, interesting to hear from you, and I, I appreciate how you take complicated issues and make them very simple for, for everyone to understand. Um, one thing I noticed in your proposals is you didn't mention anything about nuclear testing in light of the rumors this summer about U.S. resumption of testing, but then on the other hand, CTBT being a non-starter in the Senate for a re-ratification or ratification repush, are there any executive options available to an incoming administration to, to further uh, confidence on nuclear testing? Well, there, there has been a moratorium on U.S. nuclear testing in place since, I think, 1992. So we have not tested, and all administrations have abided by that. I, I would support and uh, uh, a legislation requiring explicit congressional approval of any nuclear, any resumed nuclear testing. I think that would, such legislation would have been far more valuable if there had been a second Trump administration than a Biden administration. So the Biden administration will have no intention of resuming any t uh, uh, testing of nuclear weapons. I don't think I have to worry, we have to worry about that. But one might try to put, because as you say, ratification of the CTBT is not in the cards, um, that one might try to put additional barriers in place uh, for future administrations, like a law requiring congressional approval of nuclear testing. So you think that it would, no matter what the option is, that it would have to go through Congress, essentially? There, there's an, just an executive level action or something that could be done? Well, the, you know, so Biden could have an executive order, say, you know, saying there won't be any nuclear testing in his administration, but uh, no one's worried about the Biden administration resuming nuclear testing, and all executive orders can simply be reversed by a signature of the president. So it doesn't really have any lasting effect beyond the president. So any restraint would have to come from outside the executive. So that would have to come from Congress or a treaty ratified by Congress. And, you know, we tried once to ratify the CTBT and failed. We can't try a second time and fail. The next time the CTBT comes up for ratification, it has to be for a successful vote. And unless Republicans, Republican senators agree to support it, it won't be able to have a two-thirds vote. And this will be the real challenge that we will see, and not just this area, 
all other areas in the coming administration is will Republicans in the Senate agree to cooperate? Will there be a, uh, what was it called? The problem solver caucus? <laughs> will there be a, uh, will there be a group of Republican senators who will join with the administration in um, doing things like supporting ratification of a new arms control agreement or, or the CTBT? And then, of course, there are dozens of other high priority things like a coronavirus relief bill. Well, Steve has kindly said we'll have plenty of time to continue to ask questions of him. We'll take just one more question in the formal uh, recorded part of the proceedings and uh, that one is from Jonathan Boyd. Oh my question got answered here at the beginning of the questions. I just want to say thank okay. you for uh, letting us okay. be more informed on this topic. Okay and I guess Chuck Rosenblatt then comes up next. Uh, yeah this kind of dates me. I remember back I think it was in the 1980s there was a big to-do over the development of a neutron weapon uh, the capitalist tool. Basically, it kills people and keeps uh, uh, all infrastructure in place. It just kind of fell off the map. Whatever happened with that? Well, the, this came out of something I referred to previously, is that during the Cold War, we believed that the Soviet Union was um, uh, superior to NATO in conventional strength. That if the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact decided to invade Western Europe, <clears throat> The only recourse we would have to stop that invasion was to use nuclear weapons. Now, the problem with using nuclear weapons in Western Europe is Western Europe is densely populated. And you using normal nuclear weapons, you would destroy Western Europe in order to defend it, which made no sense. And so there was a search for more credible options to, to use nuclear weapons because NATO believed it had to rely on the threat to use nuclear weapons, but that threat was not credible if the use of nuclear weapons would destroy Western Europe. And it was in that context that the neutron bomb was conceived, which did destroy buildings just over a smaller radius. It basically, its effects in killing people uh, were over a larger radius than its effects, than its blast effects. And so by aiming these small nuclear weapons against Soviet tanks, it was believed you might have a more credible option to attack the Soviet army and kill soldiers in tanks because the neutrons will penetrate steel. And I guess unless the steel, unless they fill their tanks with water, <laughs> The, uh, the neutrons would go in it. That was the idea. And so really it was all abandoned after the, the Cold War ended. After the Cold War ended, there was no longer this need to, threat, to credibly threaten the use of, the first use of nuclear weapons against conventional forces. Thank you. So it's well, a raising that, difference. Okay, thank you. On that cheerful note, uh, we'll <laughs> thank Steve very much for this very informative talk. We will continue after with uh, more informal discussion, but the recording will now, will now stop and we'll thank Steve very much again for this wonderful talk. Thank you. My pleasure.